Okay, so look, summer, we'll move a bit into the summer and autumn nutrition strategies. And I guess heat stress is still going to be one of our key issues um, and limited grazing time. And unfortunately, what we tend to see, even when there's plenty of pasture around, is it come 8, 30, 9 o'clock, this is what the cows do. Um, and, and I guess, you know, there's a couple of things that we really need to think about in, in, in trying to, to, to make sure that the cows are, are getting maximum access to to pasture in summer. Um, and I guess, you know, we can, we can talk about some of our, our heat stress strategies and we'll go straight to that um, slide here. And I guess the things that we sort of try to recommend where possible is, is milking early where possible and maximising the number of hours on feed before 9am. And I guess this is one of the keys to getting reasonable pasture intake because once we get a bit of sun and humidity up, these cows are going to look for shade come about nine o'clock. I think one of the tactics that we've used at times, and, and it's a bit counterintuitive, is that when we have abundant feed and we get a bit of heat stress, we, we often still think there's probably opportunities for cows to eat if they're near shade. And I guess, Rob, this is something we used to do up with your cows up on the river up there, but we've done it in a number of other areas, either with feed pads or by bringing feed to, to cattle and providing high quality additional forage near shade. So once these cows are running for the trees, thinking about having some really good quality silage available for them to, to, to come and pick at, you know, near the shade and just in some hay racks can be a huge benefit. And I guess what we've done in the past is we, we tend to recommend if you're going to bring that in racks, don't have the actual racks sitting in the shade because you don't want the cow, cows camping on them. Have the racks about 10, 15 metres away from where that shade is. And the cows will just cycle from the shade, they'll come out, they'll have a bit of a pick, they'll go back to the shade. But you don't actually want them camping around those little feed stations, okay, because you can end up with a hell of a mess and that leads us to a lot of other problems. We shouldn't forget the basics when we get into this heat stress season of, of shade sprinklers and fans at the dairy if possible. And again, you know, there's some good examples of these in the district, but there's still a lot of people out there that we're, we're not quite hitting even the basics of having sprinkler systems there to allow cooling of cows. Pasture quality we've already touched on, and I guess Luke's mentioned the, the option of pre-mowing. Um, and again, we've certainly found that pre-mowing can be a very successful option for, for getting intakes into cows very quickly. We find that if we, if we have forages available for these cows that are pre-mowing when they come out in the morning, they'll take those in very, very quickly, okay? And, and our intakes can, can be, be super fast. We actually get better control of our pasture quality as well. So that can certainly be something that, that, that people think about. We'll talk about the concentrate management stuff shortly. So any other questions around, around those, those basic strategies for, for heat stress and, and getting cows to eat during the heat? Neil, we were just talking there before about pre-mowing the um, kaikia that's got a bit ahead of us. Yep. Um, you know, is that a good option at the minute or is that going to deliver a lot of low quality feed to them? Well, look, it's, it's, it, it depends on how far ahead it is, Luke. Quite often, if, if, you, if you're going to mow it, you, you're going to have this sort of balance that you've got to find between actually letting them pick the best out of it and actually, mm. yeah, to pick that up, they are going to consume a lot of lower quality feed, but they're going to do it a bit more quickly. So I, I just wonder with, you know, if it is really getting ranking away from them, if you're better off taking the tops off it and then topping it, Luke. Okay. Yep. If it was moderate or reasonable quality, I'd be quite comfortable with the pre-mowing to encourage intake. But if it's getting really long and ropey, I'd probably just let the cows pick the eyes out of it and be prepared to waste a little bit with topping. And Josh looks like you might have a comment on that. Um, but yeah, what are your yeah, thoughts, look, Josh? Now, I, yeah, look, I agree 100%. And I was, before uh, Luke popped on, I was going to sort of suggest the same sort of thing, is that you do need to be careful when talking about pre-mowing as to what you are pre-mowing. Like, are you pre-mowing quality or are you pre-mowing a heap of crap underneath that's going to get mixed up in good quality and you'll get a, a one they'll either leave it there and they won't eat it or you'll get a drop in the vat and um, drop in milk production and you're not getting any you know the only thing you're actually doing properly is is resetting the residuals and, and allowing the pasture to come back quality wise so in that sense it's, it's always good to check the pasture and make sure that if that's the case sort of go back to what you know I was talking about early in the conversation is get your um get your cows to run across it remove all the leaf and the quality which we want them to eat and then if there's still residual 
that there's a big on topping in the stack. Um, in years like this, if, we, if it continues to keep going, we're going to need to top or reset more than normal. Um, but uh, you know, if you get your grazing management right, you'll need to top less. If you get your grazing management wrong, you'll, you'll need to top a hell of a lot more. So get grazing management right first. Just a comment, Neil, that I've heard um, Bill talk about at times is that you do have an option to, to mulch low and actually set, you know, take the, the leaf off what Josh is saying, but yep. if there's not too much, you can actually mulch very low and it, it'll set the kike back that little bit and improve quality. It's just, you know, it is, so rather than taking it off at five centimetres, mulch it right down. No, I think, I think that's really spot on, Pete. And, 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 and again, you know, it's only going to grow back from where it was left last time. But we know that the initial growth is generally leaf. So, so mm. taking that low crown down, really beneficial. And I guess when we're talking about preparation also for autumn planting, you know, I'd love to see Kaikuyu paddocks get mulched into the ground at least twice during the growing season and taken right, right back to that, that yep. very low residual just to, to, to really improve our probability of getting our grasses through them later in the season as well. All right, any other comments from the, from the team out there? Neil, just a, a question on the mulch thatch that could be left there. Is there yep. any, any fears of facial eczemas and things in this current climate with the, the heat and humidity about now? There's no doubt that we could see some mycotoxins. I would be highly doubtful that that would be true facial eczema. Um, it tends to be much more associated with, with residual ryegrass breakdown and, and, and it's a southern issue, Luke. It doesn't mean to say that other mycotoxins couldn't flourish in that environment, but they're not likely to be um, the, the, the fungus that's associated with um, true facial eczema, which we see in the south. So, yeah, I, I guess one of the things where, where we... we value I guess some more research up in the in the northern areas is what are the roles of some of these other pasture mycotoxins. Um, you know we know we, we're using mycotoxins in response to to, to problems with some of our conserved feeds okay and also even some of our stored byproducts which can get a bit mouldy at this time of year. The thing we don't really have a handle on uh, and we do get some reports of anecdotal response is, is what are the role of other pasture mycotoxins and, and fungal infections in the northern areas, particularly in, in summers like this, as you allude to, Luke? Uh, I don't know if anyone else has got any comments there. Simon, you've, you've played around with some mycotoxin binders up there through summer. What are your thoughts, mate? Yeah, we've um, only sort of put them through the mixer wagon, so um, that's sort of something we use when we're using our silage through the mixer wagon, but we've never sort of dispensed it in the dairy as such. So, yep. Um, as a general, yep. Yeah. Yeah, we just don't don't have a good handle on this, and 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 Pete, it's something that's, that's probably worth touching on a bit later. Is you know, what what are the roles of, of pasture mycotoxins in 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 summers like we have now? I think that can be an issue. So I guess look, just some other basics. I guess of summer nutrition. Um, and we're we're rolling down our last half hour now. I guess feed testing. You know, a lot of people will have accumulated a lot of forage. Um, over the spring, um, either bought or, or on farm. Um, Kyle, I don't know what the, the prevalence of feed testing is up in the Hunter, but if it's anywhere like anywhere else, it's probably minimal. Um, and, and, you know, there's a few guys testing some feed, but there's a lot of people out there just accumulating feed and we're not really developing a good knowledge base about that, that quality and how some of that feed's best, best redistributed. So look, again, our rules of thumb is that if you're going to be feeding any supplementary forage at this time of year, it actually needs to be your best quality forage um, because you want to encourage both intake and production. And there's not a lot of problem point supplementing a, lot, a lower quality summer forage based with more lower quality forage. So knowing where your best silage is sit is very, very important this time of year. Um, again, we've touched on keeping the rotation short and the fertility high in the paddock. The other thing I guess we should touch on is, is matching up protein needs. There's a pretty good argument at this time of year for, for use of some additional bypass protein in most rations. Um, one of the issues this year is that the canola market hasn't come back as far as is probably forecast. So it is a little more expensive than, than what we expected. While the grain market has come back nicely, um, we're still looking at canola at probably 4, 440 to 460 a tonne unless you've 
already locked in. So I guess, you know, it still would probably work on your current milk prices up there to have that in there. But we just need to be aware that that canola price hasn't come back uh, to the extent where it was originally forecast. Um, this time of year, we need to think also about, you know, some shift in some of our additive profile. You know, looking at, at, at bicarb um, at this time of year can certainly be advantageous to help encourage both intake but also to balance some of the bicarb losses from cows uh, over and above the, the, the acidosis benefits. As cows sweat and drool with heat stress, you know, there is a much greater loss of bicarb at this time of year. So we'd often increase our bicarb feeding at this time of year where it can be delivered uh, to, to, to help with some of these, these losses. Certainly increasing our salt intake, particularly if we don't have access to bicarb can be quite important because uh, we know that the kikuyu and the summer grasses actually take up very low levels of salt. Uh, in those forages um, when compared to ryegrass. And we need to be thinking to, to, to replace, you know, what they're losing both in milk, but also there's an increased salt loss associated with sweating at this time of year with cows. Um, obviously keeping on touch of our other bits and pieces is important, you know, we and, and making sure that we have good room and health, but again, we won't, we won't um, labour too much in that area. I guess, look, some reasonable evidence coming through of, of yeast being beneficial at, at, at improving intake and, and forage to digestibility over summer. Something we should be, you know, again, starting to explore. We're starting to explore a little bit more yeast use with some trials at, at, at the moment on farms uh, that we're working with. Okay, so look, any, any other Neil, questions there? Neil, it's Josh, I've got a question. Um, so, you know, I guess it's been a bit abnormal to, to other summers as well. We've got a really good start and um, we've got a lot of rain and, and a lot of growth now. Um, if you are managing your pastures correctly and you have good quality feed going in, um, I just sometimes I, I, I think some people are overdoing the protein side. Um, if we've got well-fertilised pastures, high-quality kikuyu even that, that's fertilised well, um, rotation's really good, and they're sort of just going to their normal summer diet. Um, and it happens a lot that I see guys just, that's just what they do this time of year. Yep. And they're whacking a heap of canola and, and cotton meal and all this sort of stuff in. Yep. Um, thoughts on that? Look, a couple, couple of thoughts. Firstly, you, you can be absolutely right. Our, our sort of gross protein needs, when you look at it across the diet, can, can be exceeded. Sometimes, however, we do see, and there's reasonable research in this space on an additional beneficial effect, particularly in summer on driving intake of high quality bypass protein sources. So does it need to be as much as some farms do? Perhaps not. I guess our, our bigger challenge is that, that, that there are next to no farms that actually test summer pasture quality to, 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 to know what's really going on there. So again, it's another bit of a black hole in, 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 in the information space. Um, but look, I think, you know, certainly compared to winter, yes, we'd run slightly higher bypass levels at, at, in our summer diets compared to the high quality winter pastures where, you know, minimal additional protein is really required most of the time, unless, you know, you've got extraordinarily high producing herds. So, yeah, I think, I think keeping a good eye on it, and again, it's, a bit, it's this issue it goes back to the first line in that slide is understand your forages you know, more feed testing of pastures, um, because it can tell us a lot. It can also tell us that our proteins are much lower than we expect. And I guess one of the things that you'll see, Josh, with a lot of farms is that they won't necessarily be keeping the fertiliser up on their grasses because they've got plenty of grass and, you know, it's a perfectly rational decision to say, well, I don't need any more grass. I'm not going to use any more fertiliser. But every rotation, we're dropping two or 3% off the protein in that kikuyu as we go around. And it can give us a good indication to say, well, why aren't we getting the results that we should be getting, you know, with this pasture by doing a bit of pasture feed testing? Neil? Yeah. Simon, yep. Yeah, um, I guess, we, you know, I, we, we have, you know, not on this farm, but in, in the past we've done um, a fair bit of pasture testing on, you know, on the pasture. And yep. I guess we've got to be a little bit careful that, um, you know, your feed test is just a calculation of nitrogen in the grass to get the right things. <laughs> So, you know, soluble protein, especially if we were whacking out a heap of nitrogen, um, yep. you can look at a feed test and go, oh, yeah, we've got plenty of um, plenty of uh, protein there, but actually it's uh, all you're measuring is a heap of excess nitrogen that cows can't use. Look, I, I agree, Simon, and that's where there's benefit in going into the fractionated feed testing if you're going to bother, mm -hmm. okay? So using either feed central or forage labs as opposed to the classic 
feed test, which is just giving you 6.25 times the percent of nitrogen. And, and there is much better feed test information out there, very similar pricing to what you paid for traditional feed tests. And I'd encourage people to look at probably Forage Labs or Feed Central for that additional information, which fractionates out that soluble fraction and gives us a much better indication. But that's a, that's a spot on comment. And, and, and we certainly can see a lot of that accumulating just as, as, as um, non-protein nitrogen in those pastures. The other um, thing we're finding in the Hunter here, and I'm sure it's probably in the North Coast as well, is um, especially with fresh cows, we're getting a lot of milk fever cases, even if they are um, using a springer ration as such. Yep. And I can probably talk to you, Neil, it's probably more, you know, touching on that minerals and additives front. Yep. And, you know, the, are they getting enough magnesium or is there too high a protein what those springs are actually eating and that's causing metabolic issues or um you know the other ways that people can reduce can that manage it look and, and number one normally warren will be excess potassium in the forages that they're eating and i guess getting getting some proper handle on that because we can get to a point where if, if the potash is in the forages are too high it's very hard to beat that with even the best springer ration um but i'd i'd always be starting a, a Apart from a, a look at the milk at the at the Springer ration, a real good um, testing of, of the forages that they're eating, because we know even your your cereal haze in the Hunter tend to accumulate much more potassium than some of the others. Um, but if those cows have got access to reasonable areas of self, you know, generating kikuyu or liver seed grass on old Springer paddocks, that stuff will be growing incredibly rapidly, and can be four to five percent potassium on a dry matter basis. Um, and it can be an absolute nightmare to control those big springer paddock areas when you get a flush like you're going to be getting there now. Well, I guess the biggest yeah. problem is usually they're not eating a lot of that feed, but um, at the moment trying to reduce a, an area where those springers are is yep. pretty challenging when it's so boggy and so forth and you're going to create a mess. So uh, uh, absolutely. You've got to let them graze those big areas and try and manage it as best you can. So. No, look, it's, it's, it's really difficult, Was and I guess the things we look at are, are things like mulching those areas, um, if you can, just to keep the feed down. But you've got to make sure that the alternate forage is highly palatable um, and low in potassium if you've got it. And look, we can work harder in that mineral space to try and shift the decat around, but very hard to shift once you get up to four or five percent potassium and in, in, in 80% of their intake, which would be the forage. And you know, you just, just look at those paddocks, you, 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 might be, you might have a two hectare springer paddock. If it's growing at 100 kilos a day, you know, you've got 200 kilos of dry matter of grass coming up through that paddock and that might have 10 springers on it. You know, you, you just can't win. Um, and it's, um, it's really difficult. Yeah, Josh. Yeah, Neil. So, yeah, look, and all that's really good. So one thing I'd just like to add to that is that the importance of your rotation length. So, um, and, and uh, there's a bit of evidence out there to show that, you know, the leaf uptake of potassium and nitrate early is it can be really high compared to the amount of dry matter available. So when we get these flushes, it's really important that um, it happens really quick. And if we do go to a point where guys are on too quick of a rotation, so whether it's ryegrass or cocu, um, if they're going around and it's you know one or two leaf on ryegrass or it's two to three leaf even on uh, cocu, um, you can even see that the amount of nitrate and potassium in the plant um, can be a lot higher. Um, even if it's the same soil availability compared to when it's at four, four and a half leaf as well. So understanding the amount that, um, you know, getting your rotation length right is also going to fix a lot of those issues or or reduce some of the risk of that issue as well. No, fair, fair comment, Josh. Look, I guess just, just feed testing and there's a couple of feed tests. It just shows the profound difference in some of the, the silages if we're not testing here. And I guess... Here we've got a, a reasonably good, um, what have we got? I think it's one of our forage sorghum silages. And again, Simon, you can start to see some of this um, protein fractionated out on these proper feed tests, you know, that I think we're, we, we all should be looking at. Um, but, you know, we've, we've got 9.2 megajoule silage there. You know, you compare this, when you drop 0.7 of a megajoule out, you drop 10% protein out. And again, that could be basically, it's driven predominantly by the NDF on those, which is changed by 10%. And that could be a weak difference in cutting at the moment. So again, sometimes we're stuck with this, but we need to understand what we do with it when we get, when we get these, these, these lower quality forages. 
Um, and again, it, it also, I, I think feed testing is just a wonderful training tool that continues to emphasise why there is value in us tracing better quality feed when we put it in a bale, when conditions allow us to do that.